Welcome to Archery Pop Shots, a series in which I, as an archer and a gaming and history enthusiast, critique archery in video games. Today, we'll be taking a look at a cult classic, Mount and Blade. When it comes to historical and medieval themed video games, few have the cult following that surrounds Mount and Blade by Tell World Interactive. If you're looking at this game and wonder about how outdated it looks, well, consider that when Mountain Blade was in development, it was basically described as Elder Scrolls on horseback, and not Skyrim, but Oblivion. I played the beta back in 2007 when I was still in university and became obsessed with its gameplay, offering a more intense real-time battle environment than any other game at the time, giving you a taste of what it might be like to be a single warrior in an army. Mountain Blade was a pioneer of the genre, which has since seen attempts to replicate it in a few other games. We'll be focusing on the Warband installment, which is the update and overhaul to the original game. So without further ado, let's journey to Calradia and experience the chaos of medieval war with Mount, Blade and of course, Bow. Mountain Blade is set in the fictional realm of Cal Radia, with its factions going through phases of war and peace. Each faction is loosely modelled after a real world counterpart. The Swadians, with their knights and heavy infantry, are based off Western European kingdoms. The Vagias are the Eastern European counterparts. The Nords reflect the Viking influence. The Rodox, with a specialised set of crossbowmen and pikemen, may be based on the Swiss. The Kyrgyz are clearly based on the steppe nomads, while the Sarinid Sultanate is derived from Muslim empires. Each of these factions vie for control of towns, cities and castles dotted around Karadia. You as the player may opt to pledge allegiance to a faction, fight to claim more land for the king or otherwise declare an independent realm and fight for recognition. Players will encounter enemies on the field, initially starting off as bandits but soon fighting bigger foes such as lucrative caravan raids and then major battles with hundreds of gold trained soldiers. Sieges will also pop up as you lead your men to attack or defend the walls, which always turns out to be a bloody engagement with hundreds dead on either side. As battles go up in size, things get really chaotic. Javelins and arrows fly everywhere, your men get cut down by the terrifying barrage of enemy archers, you lead a brave cavalry charge against the enemy infantry, or circle around and pick off loose soldiers with deadly precision. Reinforcements arrive to mop up the remainder of troops. Hundreds of bodies litter the battlefield, and then you do it all again. These battles are always intense, whether it's seeing how quickly you can break an outnumbered army to fighting for your very survival. These skirmishes are the main source of replay value in Mount and Blade. The actual combat for its time was innovative. Most games at this point are simplistic attack and block mechanics. Mountain Blade highlighted directional blocking with attacks requiring a specific block or otherwise the use of the shield for full protection. This combat mechanic would be the hallmark of the Mountain Blade series. Of course, for an archery video, we more focus on the ranged aspect of the game. Like with most medieval games, archery is a relatively simple affair. Aim crosshair, release. Players can go into first person view for a better grasp of aim and distance and in most cases you will have to aim above the target. With enough character progress and practice you should be able to knock off individual headshots intuitively. For those of us who thought that the coolest thing was to make a horse archer character, you might have been shocked to see that they kinda suck. Early on, your ridicule is impossibly wide and you can't hit a blob of enemies from 10 meters away. With enough persistence, you can turn into a dashing warrior. This is because of the way the game uses stat points to develop your character. To dig into the RP mechanics for a bit, a character has three categories of points. Stat points cover strength, agility, intelligence and charisma. Each one determines how many skill points you can put into things that your character actually gets good at, such as writing, first aid and athletics. 
Then there are weapon proficiencies for each kind of weapon. While the points may seem abstract, they reflect a remarkable realism when it comes to handling bows. Firstly, to even equip certain bows, you require a certain amount of power draw, which in turn is limited by your strength. While many gamers are more accustomed to seeing archery as an agility weapon, this is true to life. Archery requires significant strength to use heavy bows, so a poorly trained fighter might be able to use weak bows, but using the war bows with more damage and speed requires more strength and power draw. This would also imply that to be a proficient archer, you need to dump points into strength, which is also convenient for melee weapons, but not so fast. The power draw requirements represent the minimum just to use the bow. The reticule is impossibly large to use, and thus you're required to invest additional points on top of the minimum requirement, up to 3 extra power draw points to gain maximum accuracy. This also represents a realistic element, as the ability to physically draw a bow doesn't mean you can control it, and extra training is needed for power and accuracy. This also means that if you are going to build a dedicated arch character, you need to put a lot of stat points into strength. And that just gets you going on foot. If you want to be a mounted archer, you have to invest points into agility to not only get the riding skill up, but the dedicated horse archery skill, without which you would have a penalty to accuracy. Once fully invested, you are finally able to shoot with maximum precision at full gallop, which reflects the immense amount of training needed to become a proficient horse archer. When you get to this point, you are absolutely terrifying. With the right bows, enough arrows and a steady hand, you can bring down masses of soldiers alone. With an army at your back and a trusty sword or spear as your backup weapon, a horse archer character is one of the most fun to play. Fans of Mountain Blade often comment on the realism of the game. Compared to the contemporary games like Oblivion, sure, it's much more grounded in history. But as a game, and limited as it was back then, we need to appreciate how much of a replica this would be compared to its historical inspiration. In terms of the general handling of the bows, it's a decent interpretation of what it takes to be an effective archer. Given the immense number of stat points needed to use the best bows, this is a fair portrayal of how specialised an archer needs to be. Also given that the same stats are used for other weapons, this would also be a fair depiction of archers being proficient in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The large crosshair is a decent presentation of the inherent floating inaccuracy which can be improved with further training and experience. Even the small, modest features which we now take for granted are innovative for its time and reflect good attention to detail. The fact that the reticle begins to widen after a few seconds represents the inability to hold a bow at full draw for too long and encourages a quicker aim and shot process. On horseback, given that all characters are right-handed in the game, archers are only able to shoot in a limited arc in front, to the left and behind. This allows for certain tactics like the passing shot, but it also reflects the limitations an army might have when deploying horse archers. In real life, a horse archer would likely have been proficient with shooting on both sides if necessary by switching hands, but otherwise this forces the player to adopt a realistic approach in circling around the opponents to shower arrows on them. The equipment is fairly generic, but otherwise based on real bows. You mostly get simple self bows when starting out, with the designs branching out into European war bows, and the composite bows more commonly seen in Asiatic archery. The damage is fairly arbitrary, given that the game has to allow you to kill enemy soldiers, regardless of what armour they are wearing. Realistically, armour was actually very effective against arrows, with the typical laid armour of Mel and Gambison being very good as it was, and plate armour was nearly impervious. For those who don't want to invest time and points into developing archery, there are crossbows, which require no stat points whatsoever, and accuracy is purely based on weapon proficiency. This is also a realistic contrast, and precisely the reason why many armies, especially in Europe, 
favoured the crossbow. Overall, the feel of battle is fairly good at depicting how they might have felt with the different styles of warfare used. The scale is considerably smaller than a real battle, with only hundreds on the field compared to tens of thousands, so we don't truly get the scent of a relentless arrow storm. Still, we get a small taste, whether it's from the tenacity of cast defenders or the panic of a wave of Kyrgyz horsemen shooting arrows and running away, forcing the player to adapt their tactics and armies to fight effectively against each foe. Mountain Blade has undeniably earned its place as a cult favourite. It brought the medieval genre more into the mainstream, especially with its release on Steam. Even more so, its active modding community have produced numerous mods, covering the Sengoku period of Japan to the Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. The official releases have also been significant, especially Napoleonic Wars, which in turn inspired a genre of team-based musket warfare. A lot can be said about the success story of a small team of independent developers, and Mountain Blade truly stands out as a pioneer. Hopefully, and sometime soon, we'll see the sequel arrive on the battlefield. If you haven't yet played the game, you'll find that it still has an active online community, though the visuals might look dated and the sandbox structure a little too unguarded. But if you can enjoy the long journey to the top interspersed with quick and unforgiving combat, you'll find Mountain Blade is worth a shot. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Archery Pop Shots. As usual, shoot straight and aim for your best.